Why are you going for this for Sure. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Tony, Leaf Multifamily. Um, so it's really um, a pleasure to actually do a meetup in person after all this time. Uh, we've been doing online Zooms. So I know, <clears throat> you know, I, I know Boris and Oshi forever. We've worked together for the past six, seven years. Um, consider us like one big family. And uh, we plan to buy deals together uh, in the future to leverage, you know, um, the entire, entire investor base, right? So, um, but for Link Multifamily, we're, we're, we're a large investment club as well. We have over 1,300 people now registered to uh, invest with us. So, uh, so far, we have sponsored about four properties, um, about $86 million in assets total, and about over 700 units right now. Um, so, you know, this was a very exciting year. Uh, earlier this year, we sold a property. Um, so earlier this year, we just sold a property that we acquired about three years ago. Um, we were able to increase the value by 148% over three years. So, you know, it's gone quite well. And uh, right after that, we were able to acquire uh, a new property, 152 to work, class B property uh, in urban. So, you know, pretty busy year. We hope to keep it rolling. Okay. Um, some information about us. So real quick, um, these are the four properties that uh, we're currently managing, mostly in Texas right now. We specialize in Dallas, but we're also starting to branch out, right? Um, so the most recent one being the Vanderbilt apartment. Um, I think some of us here is actually part of that investment. So yeah, overall property is doing good. So we won't take too long to do our introductions. Um, today, we are very special. Uh, we have a very special opportunity to have uh, Mr. Paul Peebles, okay, and Mr. Fritz here to give us a presentation. So for those of you that don't know, um, Mr. Paul is what they call the godfather um, in Dallas, right? So basically he's been working, you know, doing loans on the Dallas multifamily for the past 20 years. And uh, he knows where the bones are buried. You know, probably a lot of properties have went through his hand two, three, four times already. And, um, you know, a lot of transactions go through him, right? And then we also have Mr. Fritz Waldmogel. Um, he's with Colliers, Senior Vice President at Colliers. And, you know, Fritz is who we go to when we need money, right? So uh, Fritz is a direct Fannie Mae lender. Um, so if you need agency loan, he's your man, right? So, um, especially in today's climate, you need to have as many lending options as possible. So, um, yeah. So thank you for coming, um, <clears throat> Paul and Fritz. Welcome to Silicon Valley. Yeah, they flew all the way in from, from Dallas and Minneapolis to, <laughs> to, to help us with this presentation. So good evening, everybody. I'm Paul Peebles. And if I speak too loud, somebody is listening right here. I've done this. I've done apartment lending for 36 years. I've done 6,500 apartment loans. <laughs> You're so much younger compared to that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much, but uh, we are blessed to have everybody here tonight in person. This is uh, uh, we, this is fantastic. The last week uh, on Wednesday, we had 325 people in Dallas all together. Where I kind of gave the same, same presentation that we're going to talk about today. So, uh, I want to introduce you to probably one of the best lenders out there in the United States. Uh, I want you to say hello to Fritz Waldvogel one more time. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> We're super excited to be here. Uh, Link, Multi Family, and WGI are, are great customers of ours, Paul and I. We always love going out to the Bay Area and meeting everyone in person and giving a little update on kind of what's going on in the lending world. Um, a little bit about my background. I've been with uh, Colliers for about 10 years. Um, Paul and I have closed probably two, two and a half million dollar loans together over the last five or six years. So really active 
in the marketplace, not just the Texas, but around the country. So excited to uh, give you a little update of what's going on in the marketplace. So this is kind of an interesting presentation because we live in interesting times. And you live in interesting times. And that's what we were finding today when it comes to banking, the mortgages, the apartments, to everything that has to do with lending. And so when we talk about lending, we really talk about leverage. And because leverage is such an important thing to get a rate of return on your money, we're going to talk about some of the things that have shifted or changed recently. So, and if I'm talking over your head, stop me. And I want you to ask those questions because I will be talking over your head a little bit. So, but I want you to, to hang with me and understand as much as you can because we're going to be going through a lot of stuff tonight. So, this is just not like a regular meetup where we just meet, shake hands, and say hello, everybody. This is educational. Okay? So, we're here to really educate you and make sure you know a little bit about what's going on. This is time for, for me to kind of open up my head and tell you what I'm seeing right now. So, let's kind of go into the presentation. And then you guys can if you ask a question, make sure you, you bring it up at the time and we'll handle that too. So, so that's good. So this is a presentation on what I am seeing, what Fritz is seeing today. This is not something that we saw six months ago. This is like something that we've seen in the last two months, month and a half or so. And I'll start this off by saying, uh, how many people listen to the Old Capital podcast? We download it 60,000 times a month. We appreciate you guys listening and spending some time with us over the podcast. My partner on that is Michael Becker. He is where the rubber beats the road. He is an operator of almost 10,000 apartment units, class A and class B, very knowledgeable, and he tries to get as much information as possible. So I take a lot of information from a lot of operators about what's going on. I want to kind of tell you a reflection of what they're seeing and what we're seeing and what you kind of, kind of got, guys got to uh, know. This is how we're going to sum it up. The good. <laughs> the, the, the ugly. <laughs> All right. So the good has been, so I've been doing this for 36 years. A lot of people, except for Alex, have not really been around here for 36 years. <laughs> so I've seen interest rates go down for 36 years. When I got into the, the uh, uh, lending business, I used to work for a large bank that was based out of Oakland, California, World Savings. Does anybody remember World Savings? Thank you, thank you. I was with them for a long period of time. They actually moved me to Texas back in 92. So, at that very time, I entered banking back in 1985. Interest rates were on home loans 16%. Prime rate was at 21%. And now we've seen the interest rates go down and down and down and down. And so today, probably about uh, oh, probably about a month and a half ago, two months ago, we've seen them start to go up. And so that's been the good. As interest rates have come down, people have made a lot of money with interest rates coming down. The bad is 10 year treasuries on the rise by a show of hands. How many people have lost a couple of dollars in the stock market these days? Thank you. <laughs> it's not good. But that's one of the things that the, we're reflecting on is interest rates rising and possibly a large amount of inflation that's coming. That's already here. You know, I would say gas prices in Dallas are probably about. Well, they were about 388, now they're at 440. I see with the gas price in the Bay Area. That's a tangible thing of, of inflation. But what we're, they're trying to do is it's kind of stop inflation by putting a wet blanket on raising, raising interest rates. And so that's the bad. But for us, the ugly is the short term loans, the short term bridge loans on multifamily properties. And that is a thing, an index that we use, we used, used to use a thing called MyBoard. London Interbank operating. Now we're using SOFR, S O F R. That's kind of the short term overnight borrowings that between banks, when they don't have enough uh, equity, they need to borrow money from another bank. So that's the short term borrowings. That used to be for three, four, five years, 
zero five, 0 0.05. That has gone up. Any idea where that is today? 0.81. So it's gone point from 0 0.05 to 0.81. And we're going to talk about where that's going because that's that's an important thing. So I could stand up here and kind of just talk a little bit about all the good stuff that's going on, but unfortunately, for, unfortunately for you, uh, Tony and the guys over at WGI wanted me to kind of talk a little bit more about the reality of what we're seeing. And that's not going to be all the best stuff. I want to make sure you understand. I'm going to shake you up a little bit when it comes to apartment uh, investing. We still are very positive about it, but we also want to make sure we tell you the truth and what the reality is about what's going on right now and the effect it's going to have on real estate. So Fred, can I have you jump in here a little bit sure. and talk a little bit about what's going on that you've seen in the last 60 days? Yes, yeah, so like Paul mentioned right. in the last... Sure. Yeah. So in the last 60 days, um, apartment um, financing has changed very significantly. And a lot of that is due to what the Fed has been communicating, right? So the Fed for a long time since COVID has said, we're gonna be at 0% interest rates for the next three years. This is a 2020. So as Paul mentioned, sulfur and LIBOR were at like zero. And then now, and about maybe if you want to go back, I don't know if I can go back. Yeah, I'll see if I can go. Can I go back this one? So maybe I'll have the 10 year up so you can see. So in about last December, the Fed pivoted. So the Fed basically said, instead of being we're going to get zero for a long time, they're not going to raise rates. They decided, hey, inflation is really bad. And we have a couple you know, slides on that. We need to control inflation. And so with that, interest rates rose very significantly. So for example, um, the two-year treasury rate, I'm giving you a slide on this one there, but the two-year treasury rate The two-year treasury rate went from 0.16 to 2.60. That's an insane jump. That's the equivalent of the of the 10-year rate going from uh, one and a half to like 30%. It's massive. And so much of the financing is controlled by both the 10-year treasury and the short-term rates. So we underwrite deals, for example, on fixed rate loans. We can only size to certain mortgage loans based on what the interest rates are. So when you went from a 3% borrowing rate two or three months ago to five to five and a quarter today, you're seeing loan proceeds go from 70% leverage to 55, 50% leverage. And so some traditional lenders, lenders like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, uh, and HUD have considerably pulled back their leverage. Um, so like I said, we gave this presentation uh, two or three years ago in person, um, and at that point, we were talking, how can you get 75% leverage? How can you get 80% leverage? That's not even in the ballpark. And so with that, your leverage are coming down. So equity, equity returns have um, come down a little bit too. So in terms of the general market, with the rise in interest rates, we've seen pricing come down. So instead of what the brokers were listing and saying, say a building was going to be $10 million whisper price. Now, people that were, you know, maybe an LOI or a P, uh, purchase and sale agreement at that $10 million amount, that's now like 90 million or uh, 9 million. We're seeing a 5 to 10% decrease in pricing because of how the debt markets have changed in the last 60 days. Um, so, right, and this is all happening like live, like in the last 60 days. Um, so, it's a really challenging time. Um, so, it's very nimble. You also have a ton of new apartment inventory coming. If you look at across the metro or across the nation, Dallas in particular, there's tons of new inventory. And so you got to balance absorption. Fortunately for Dallas um, and a lot, of, a lot of major metros, you have a lot of net migration from wherever that's California or New York. And so it's helping some of that absorption, but it is, it is um, somewhat of a problem. And we'll get into some of the other issues here in a bit in terms of the short term. Is that the inventory that's coming? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, are the new inventory new construction? And that, that is correct. So it's mostly multi-family you're talking about. Correct, yes, multi-family. Yeah. Today we're talking about apartments. And we don't necessarily have to talk about apartments in Texas. 
because the, the guys at WGI have bought properties outside of Texas. So we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of buying outside Dallas. Somebody was asking me about how big Dallas is. Dallas is now the third largest metroplex in the nation. New York being one, Los Angeles being two. You would think Chicago, but it's not. It is Dallas. It is over eight and a half million or 8.2 million people. So a lot of people continue. And we appreciate all the Californians coming to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Politics here, we come on over, we appreciate that. So um, just like we're very positive on the fundamentals of apartments. Rent has gone up year over year, 17, 18%. Amazing. We're at full occupancy on these properties, about 96% occupied nationwide in these properties. Uh, rental growth, if we took away just last year from say May to this May, rental growth for the rest of this year will be about 6% rental growth. So these are just huge, fundamental, very positive numbers. What we're, what I'm concerned with, what Fritz is concerned with, is the capital markets. With interest rates going up, I want to have you kind of think through this. Interest rates go up, it's a little bit like a teeter-totter. Interest rates go up, debt service goes up, becomes more expensive to own a property, I'm going to lower interest rates go up. I'm going to lower your loan amounts. And that's what's happening. I'm lowering your loan amounts. Well, we were able to get 80% leverage. Now we're at 70 or 65. And these are on bridge loans. And I'm going to talk, let's talk a little bit about that in a second. I'm going to take a step back. 80 to 85% of all the loans that we've made for the last two years have been bridge loans. Not Fannie Mae loans, but bridge loans. Fannie Mae is for buyers of apartments that really look at the historical numbers on what the property has done for trailing one, trailing six, trailing 18, 24, almost 36 months. It looks backwards. So like when you're driving your car and you're looking what's behind you, that is exactly what we're looking for to qualify for Fannie Mae. We look at historicals. When people are buying properties today, in the last two, three years, we've been looking forward looking. Fannie Mae is not a forward looking lender. They are, uh, again, a historical looking lender. So when people buy apartments, they're trying to fix them up because they're trying to create value of the property. So they buy, let's say, a $10 million property. They, they want to put a million dollars in worth the rehab to the property. So they want to bring the rental income up on that property. Bridge loans have been able to do that. Bridge loans are the way to acquire property, re up the property, stabilize the property, and then refinance it to Fannie Mae, okay? Bridge loans are the ones that are, are gonna have be impacted by this rise of interest rates the most. So again, when the interest rates go up, we're seeing that leverage cut back. And so eventually we're gonna have a, a, a problem. That's what we're starting to have. I want to tell, tell you that a lot of people that took out 80% loans back, uh, back 18, 24 months ago, they're going to come to a maturity because these loans, these bridge loans are not for, for 10 or 12 or 15 years. They are for, say, three years with two one-year extensions. Three years of interest only, two years with uh, advertising loans, and then you have, to, you have to go over some hurdles to get these additional two years. So these three, these three, three year loans come in this, this maturity that you have to do the game plan, acquire the property, rent the property, push rents up. And if you can't do that, then there's gonna be a knock at your door at some period of time saying, hey, listen, you gotta refinance our deal or we're gonna to have to take over the property, says the lender. We don't wanna have that happen. But the fundamentals, one second, we said, the fundamentals are still very strong on the, the real estate. It is the capital markets that right now are screwed up. And then we'll talk a little bit about how long they're gonna be screwed up. And this may be an opportunity for you to try to assemble some cash to start thinking about buying properties here in the future. So I don't know how long this, this storm is gonna last, but it's gonna last maybe a year, a year and a half or so, two years, but you're gonna be able to buy up these properties at lower prices 
coming in the future than you are buying them. You've been buy, able to buy them recently. Lisa. Does rate limit require a rate cap on one-year Great question. So the question is, is does the bridge lender require a rate cap? Okay. So what is a rate cap? A rate cap is like an insurance policy. So most of these loans are based on adjustable rates. Okay. So that, that SOFR is the index. So what makes up an interest rate? Index plus margin equals interest rate. The margin is the fixed rate portion of the interest rate. The index is a thing that can change. So SOFR is a thing that can change. So if we took out a loan today and I were to give you uh, a spread, a profit spread of say 4%, Index right now is a little bit less than 1%. So that would be four plus one, be a little bit less than 5%. We think the SOFR is going up to say 3%, over 3%. So four plus 3.1 equals about 7%. So that's where we're, we're, we're going to, because we can see the forward curve on the short-term rates and where that's going to, okay? The question comes back to, do you have insurance to protect you of having this thing go up too much? And the answer is yes. And that is a, a, an interest rate cap. That is an insurance policy that the lender is going to require you to get that's going to give you the ability to figure out how much risk do I want to have? How much risk do I have if I don't have insurance on my, my car or my house? What happens if there's a fire? Insurance caps are a similar thing. What they're saying is that you tell me on the loan amount how much risk you want to have. The lender's going to probably tell you how much they want to have for coverage, but then you can also can tell them of how much you want to have if, if it wants to be even greater. So these caps are, and let's just use that, that 5% as an example. You can buy 1% cap strike price, which means that, that if the interest rate went up to say 6%, anything greater than 6%, you would have insurance. Okay, you can buy it one and a half. So anything greater than six and a half, you would have insurance. Two percent, you, you understand where I'm going with on that. Or you can bring it down to a half a percent. Jeff, can you say a few words about what it means to have insurance? Like how is it? So if you don't have insurance, you're exposed to interest rates going up and higher debt service on the loan. If, in, in the lender is concerned that if you don't have insurance, if the, if the rate were to go to six or 7%, you're underwater and you can't make your pay. So the lender wants to make sure that you have that insurance. They usually, they will require it just so you make sure like, okay, whatever, uh, the, the calculation usually is that exactly what your NOI is is equal to your debt service. And that's what the help of the calculation. So the insurer essentially pays you for anything about six. Correct. That's an example. Those costs have gone up significantly in the last, say, six weeks. You used to be able to buy a cap, let's just say $25 million for, say, two years. So you'd have two years of coverage, and maybe it was a 2% above that, that strike price for maybe $80,000. Because you remember what Fritz was saying is that we, we were convinced that we were being told that interest rates were gonna remain flat. So it was kind of a zero sum game theory that why pay for insurance if you already knew that interest rates were gonna be flat? Well, today, that cap has gone up to almost a million dollars of cost. Eight to a million bucks on a $25 million transaction. This is getting a, a star. I can, <laughs> I can tell you that she's asking all my questions. So that is a concern because now, not only do we have interest rates going up, we have cap rate costs that are, are expanding too. So if you bought a property back a year and a half ago, it wasn't really a problem because your cap rates were like $70,000, $80,000 and you had the, the insurance in place. Interest rate cap, rate caps, not, not insurance in case the place burns down, but interest rate caps. So you were able to buy them at a cheap price. If you did a Fannie Mae loan, as an example, or a Freddie Mac loan that was a straight adjustable rate, because these are based on adjustable rates. If you took out a loan back, say, 18 months ago, you got to buy that cap when you originated that loan. You had to buy a three year cap, three year interest rate cap. We were putting aside on a $25 million deal, $500 a month in a reserve of that account. 
Now I gotta buy, rebuy that cap again, that each trade cap uh, on, on 136. Now, when they do the analysis on the escrows, because that cap is now going up so much, it's gone from 500 to $9,500 a month that you've got to put aside. This is where some of the opportunities are going to come because a lot of, a lot of equity uh, investors, people that put money into these deals, have not put a lot of money into these uh, into the liquidity after one closes. So that's where you have to. There may be an opportunity in these deals to rescue these these properties because just like what we were saying before, if you saw it, uh, with interest rates going up. What we have seen is that the in a crowded movie theater, someone has yelled fire, and everybody's trying to make decisions to leave the building. And they're bringing all this inventory onto the market right now, where they think they can get the highest price for the properties. Now we're seeing values of these properties go down by 10 or 12%. It's just supply and demand. So much inventory is going to mark these things down to a certain extent on these properties. That's when some of the, the opportunities are going to come in the future. So the, and again, I, I don't want to have this, like we talked about last week in this presentation that was really a Dallas centric audience. And we do a lot of business in Dallas. I mean, we do six or $700 million a quarter in apartment loans, old capital does. But one of the things that, again, one of the straight fundamentals is we don't have enough apartments. We don't have enough uh, houses in the United States. We're short. And we're from two and a half to five million uh, rental units in the United States. New home buyers are challenged. I don't know if anybody's gone out to look for buying a new house these days. Everybody refinanced when the rates went down to two and a half percent. And now that house is becoming something that they, they want to maybe buy a bigger house these days. Interest rates right now are about 557, 570 in that range. So debt service on that is becoming more, more expensive on the single family side. People are starting to go with adjustable rates on the, the single family side instead of 30 year fixed rates. This is a 30 year fixed rate on this one. And the last one here is that we've seen just in the last say six months, year over year of an increase of valuations on single family homes of 18%. So everything's getting more expensive. We like the fundamentals of all apartments because to qualify for a $360,000 loan on FHA, 3.5% uh, down payment, you have to make about $120,000 a year to do that versus we just use two and a half to three times income to qualify for an apartment building. So this one's like maybe $3,200 or $3,300 a month, where apartments are about $1,600, $1,700, $1, $1,800 a month. So bigger savings. In that 30 year mortgage rate two months ago was three and a quarter percent. Yeah, I mean, crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, I heard all the analysts talking about the housing shortage that we have in the Northeast, but I appreciate it. Still not enough. They're more like pockets. So, like, there's, there's certain pockets in neighborhoods and cities where there's still over exposure in some cities with some net migration. We have issues, but generally it's fundamentally across the US. We are building 43,000 apartment units in Dallas right now, and that's still not enough. What it's 43,000 new family members coming in to, to acquire these properties, and that's still not enough properties. So, just some more just general observations of, of some data. This is from Moody's. Um, so, like, like we talked about earlier, they can see. I just picked a few markets that I know uh, some of the parties that are invested in. So for example, in Dallas, you know, super healthy vacancy, uh, 5.5% or 5.3%, Evansville, 3.5%, USA, great. The five-year forecast, also all about 5%, so super healthy. And if you look at the run growth, Paul mentioned this earlier, Dallas, just the year end of 2021, 11%, Evansville, 7 Louisville, 8 and USA, 12 the average for the US generally is about two to three percent. So these are fantastic numbers. And if you still look in the future at all those markets, you're still, most of them are over about three percent. Thank you, Joe. It's coming back. <laughs> there we go. Like Paul mentioned, all the data still supports that the apartment markets 
the actual fundamentals of operating these deals are, are great and for the foreseeable future, just based on the demographics. Yeah, um, no, this is important. So what we're telling clients that are buying apartments right now is don't try to reach. They're trying to get the biggest, baddest apartment right now. Play caution to buying apartment buildings right now. Look, look at the end game in mind. Don't uh, don't try to, to to buy a property that, that you're reaching that you don't have enough equity in the deal, and this is not a good area. As Michael Becker says, what's rule number one? Don't don't buy in the hood. Thank you. Don't buy in the hood, buy in, buy in high quality areas, better demographics. That's very, very important. Um, so you could be in a position that uh, in a little bit, and, and that could be anywhere from six weeks to six months. That I have the market kind of figure out exactly where the market's going in terms of valuations of these properties. Could these properties be down greater than 10%? I think so. I think so. Focus on cash flow and not year over year appreciation. So what happens when I open up Facebook, I see a bunch of these people like do this, and they're talking about their latest deal they bought in Houston or in Sacramento or wherever. Uh, they, they talk about last deal we gave 110% back to our investors. If you went back 40 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, there wasn't a syndication model like it is today. That's not how it was. Three rich guys, gals, buying an apartment building, and that was how it was built and bought. It was, it was your brother, his best friend, and a rich, rich guy or gal, and that's how these properties were built. And they didn't have this huge appreciation of 110 or 120% during the period of time that they owned the property. They focused in on cash flow and the benefit after cash flow, and maybe a possibly compression cap, cap, cap rate of the deal was that they got a higher valuation of the property when they went to go sell the property. That's how I want to see it go back to. People actually getting cash flow of these properties is number one. And number two, the, the cherry on the top is to have appreciation on the property. And, and in that order. So we're looking for lower leverage today we talked about that that strike price is maybe even though that's going to be higher cost to put some insurance around that that interest rate maybe it, perhaps it makes sense to buy uh, a cap rate with a smaller uh, uh, a cap strike price okay um, asset management we're seeing the property managed is super important we have too many people that buy these properties in the syndication model that go from property to property, to property, and they never look back on the properties that they bought. The only thing they focus on is what the next deal that they're going to do. That is wrong, okay? There's gotta be somebody that focuses on the intro of the asset and making sure that property is gonna be functionally working down the road. Don't keep looking at the forward looking uh, opportunities. Uh, underwrite with reasonable ca cash reserves, again, a lot of people prior the last 18, 24 months have not had money put into the entity itself. It's been one general, general partner that put the deal together and got a couple capital raisers in the deal. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was, there was, they didn't have any money and the limited partners didn't have any money. And so whenever there's a knock on the door, because again, let's, let's go back to these, these bridge loans. These bridge loans are for three years. We did them at, say, let's say, 80% leverage. Let's say $25 million or so. Interest rates are now going up. When we took the original transaction, when you guys assembled all the money to buy this property, as an example, you didn't want to put a lot of money that they thought was dead money into the partnership. So everybody said, yeah, maybe if I ever get a capital call, I'll throw the money in. 18 months goes by. Values are starting to come down. Interest rates are starting to go up. Debt service goes up. They're like, well, I, my, I'm not getting enough NOI to pay my debt service. I'm going to start to need that cash. So when they did their first 
roundup of the money when they bought the property, they gave, let's say gave $100,000 and I haven't paid them as a general partner for 18 months. But then I'm coming back and say, listen, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 25 or 100. <laughs> the guy's going to say, listen, listen, you want another $100,000? I just gave you $100,000 to get paid. I'll rate a return on my 100 grand. Now you, I'm not putting good money over bad investment. So you're going to start to, to cram down some of these deals. And so my my point on, on this type of stuff, make, make sure we underwrite reasonable capital reserves, money, liquidity into these transactions because they are gonna get these calls. Because again, these loans were for three years, as an example, the two one-year extensions, if they were to qualify, but that three years comes very quick because you have to acquire, rehab, and stabilize the asset. And if you don't, they have, you know, we have a problem, but that maturity is either the loan be paid off, again, values are falling. If the loan doesn't get paid off to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, what's the max leverage that you guys are gonna do? 75, 80%, That's whatever that new value is, assuming it under. <laughs> so his point is, is that he could go up to 75 or 80% max on the deal, but truly there's not gonna be enough NOI. So we're only gonna do a little of 50 or 55% because he's going to be debt service constrained. I just don't have enough money to, to refinance the property. There's not enough income coming into this property to refinance it. So that's where the second part of that, that equation is. To refinance and take, get that loan off that mature, that quick maturity, you're gonna go back out and ask for another capital call to, to do that. And that's gonna be a problem. That's where we see a lot of people in that opportunity. Lisa, <laughs> keep asking those questions. I love it. I think there's some different uh, thoughts about whether uh, agency lenders are gonna continue to accept the loans or not. Um, the question that Lisa has that she's been hearing about uh, different underwriting and criteria that agency lenders have. And so the answer is yes, some of the stuff has changed, but and the Fritz will tell you about it, but Fannie Mae is what Fannie Mae is. They look historically, they are not bridge lenders and they are not going to expand the box. They're not going to expand the underwriting box. Fritz, tell us a little bit about what they change. Yeah, so full Fannie Mae, they're traditionally a 1.25 debt service coverage lender. They'll come down to maybe 120 on a fixed rate. Um, so that was a change in the last couple of months. And that's for generally larger sponsors that they've had a previous history with. We'll also consider 35 year amortizations uh, for also larger sponsors that they've done 100 plus million dollars with. But when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's great. Maybe we need some more leverage on these deals because the average sizing that we put out on the acquisition is about 45 to 50% leverage. What ways to say that again? 45 to 50% leverage on these. With the agencies, and I have a slide here, and I can show you the volume and how much we're down. But that moves that change to a 120 debt service coverage and a 35 year amp gets you to like 55%. New acquisition, yeah. Uh, we'll look at this, but it still only moves the needle five to seven percent. LTV, so you're still not getting to 75 percent. Back before this run up of valuations of properties. Fannie and Freddie, we're the, the only place that we would bring, bring the transactions to. Okay. But then Fannie didn't change the rule book. It is the bridge lenders that changed the rule book to a certain extent of what they were going to allow in. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And one more quick point to that, too, is like when you have cap rates nationally, not interest rate cap, but uh, cap rates to figure out valuation, those are probably four and a half to five percent nationally. So when your borrowing rates five percent on the fixed rate, it, it just doesn't the math doesn't work make sense. You have to look at future income to figure out that math equation. So like for example, Boris, what was the first the first deal you bought in Dallas, what was the gap rate? Probably seven or eight. And your borrowing cost at that point was probably four and a half percent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So now it's all it's reversed, right? Um, and that's that's why you've seen leverage put on these well, let's talk about that because that thank you for bringing that up my gold star child <laughs> all right thank you lisa we appreciate that uh, i'm going to take a side turn just for one second i'm going to finish this slide up uh underwrite to not being able to sell or refi 
near three. Again, these, these bridge loans have three year maturities with two one year extensions on the deal. Is that if, if, there's, if it's possible, if it's not possible to refinance or sell the property, be, be very careful about that. This is what is driving the valuation of these properties. How many people looked at that uh, Wall Street Journal article yesterday? Talk, talk a little bit about what, what's happening in the market. Anybody see that? Aziz, what did it say? We're just talking exactly what you're talking about. Is that um, the uh, cap rates uh, have, um, have not met up with, uh, with the uh, lenders are asking for, with the uh, loan rates. Yeah. Then that's flipped so that it's going to be a problem. Yeah. But the rents are going to keep on going up. Thank you, Aziz. That's right. But the point that Aziz was saying in the article that came out yesterday that I did this presentation, I've been talking about it for two years. I've seen this down the road. I mean, I just didn't see it last month. And the reason being is, as I see a parallel to subprime single family lending back 12, 15 years ago, I think bridge lenders today are like subprime single family lenders 12 or 13 years ago, because we, they use a CLO marketplace, the collateralized loan obligation, and they have expanded what they were willing to take in on this deal. Does everybody remember some of the uh, highlights from the subprime single family? Because if you, you bought any of the stuff on the, on the courthouse steps, you have to say in uh, Modesto as an example, which is the kind of the, uh, the uh, ground zero of, uh, of problems. How did they get there in 2012 or 13? This is an example of subprime underwriting, single family business. You may not see this, but this is what it says, no MI, no mortgage insurance. No verifications of rents, no verifications of debt deposits, no impounds or escrows, no bankruptcy season. You file bankruptcy, we'll give you a brand new loan. 1040s, <laughs> no W-2s, no credit explanations. I don't care if you have bad credit, no seasoning on funds, no problem. <laughs> this is a real lender. This, I, I, so I went back to my files and I was like, how can I make the point where the parallels start on this type of stuff? And I wanted to go a little bit farther and get the same lender. Check this out. Same lender. Everybody kind of knows what good credit scores are these days. This was 580 credit score, 100% financing on the deals. <laughs> How was that done? It was because Danny May and Freddie Mac had that box that they were not going to get away from. The CLO market created an, an unbelievable greater opportunity to do this type of stuff. And I'd always said that if a real mortgage banker were to, to underwrite these deals, underwrite the deals, not just like an investment banker trying to sell a yield on the deal, they would never have approved it. And that's a little bit how I see the mortgage banking side, bridge lending today on apartments. Same type of thinking through the CLO market. All of the craziness, that goes back to year three. I don't know if that goes. No. It goes back to this, to the to the how we underwrite these deals on year three pro forma rents. You acquire the property, you stabilize it, and now the lender at the beginning wants to find out how are you going to do three years from today? How are rents are going to go up three years from today? Yeah. <laughs> Do I have a crystal ball? We well, kind of have a general idea, but then a $25 million deal, we put that, that transaction in the hands of somebody maybe has, has never bought an apartment building, lives in San Jose and trying to buy a property in Houston or in Phoenix, and there's, there's 900 miles or 1,700 miles distance. That's what we're concerned about is these deals where underwriting is not 100% tight. And they're giving lending at 80% for the last couple of years, 75% up until January, February, now 70, 65, 70%. Now, 
is because now they're trying, their, their buckets are getting filled and I think they're starting to see the amount of risk in these deals. That's where I see the opportunity is to come in to recapitalize some of these deals. Recapitalize mean have these deals fail and come in and try to buy them. And everybody says, well, what's a CLO? Who are these lenders? Well, they're not lenders. So a lot of the bridge lenders are not lenders. They're just guys that have lines of credit, a billion dollar line of credit, and they take the loan in to buy an apartment building and then they securitize it. So this group right here, this is uh, ready cap. They did a securitization of $1.135 billion just back in March. And it was bought from 27 unique investors. Those are unique investors it got non-recourse, non mark to the market term financing. So they, so think of an apartment transaction that is like a, uh, like water. This right here is twenty five million dollars, and I throw that into a pool, a swimming pool, as an example. And then we combine all these transactions together, and then it goes into securitization to sell pieces of all these deals to everybody else: fixed income, pension funds, fixed income to do it. And what they did is they took 67 ready cap originated first lien mortgage loans secured by 90 properties across the United States. The portfolio includes primary mortgage loans. 92% were, were uh, apartment loans over a period of 21 states. So it was arranged by, the CLO was arranged by a bank syndicate. This is the securitization pool for you guys to be able to buy it. You guys being pension funds, fixed income for your 401ks and things like that. These are the guys that I'm, 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 a little, I'm concerned with, okay? Because again, they are just, they're doing the best they can because there's a, this huge demand. And if we didn't have this bridge loan and we didn't have the CLO, nobody wouldn't be buying apartments and having the interest in having uh, the values go up. Okay. This is this is where it's, I think it's a little scary. So if you can see this, this is what we talked about before: adjustable rate plus fixed rate equals the the true actual interest rate. So for last year, it was 0.05. The three and a half was the mar the margin. The 355 would get you 80 percent leverage deal. Today it's 0.81. Margin the spreads have gone up because they are imputing additional risk on these deals. Right now, rates are about 506. Again, these are adjustable rates. So they're, next year, we're thinking that SOFR is going to be at 3.1 with a four and a half margin, all in at 7.6 and a 65% max LTV. That's where we think that there's, again, an issue is that when rates go up, and this is for like a, kind of a new loan, but when rates go up, it's going to be 7.6. And if you didn't have that interest rate cap, you start off again, if we started off today, we started off today, it would just be right here, okay? But, it, but take this, add this to it, and that's what your interest rate is going to be. And if you didn't have an interest rate cap on the deal, uh, you'd be up and over that. How did that come, how did you get that? I'm assuming that's LT. Loan to cost. Loan to cost. Yeah. How, how, how did you get from 7.6 to like a 65% system? Because essentially, with as the rates have gone up, bridge lenders look at it on a, on a debt yield basis, like a going in debt yield. But before, they would be like 4% going in debt yield. Now they've increased that to 4.5%, 5%. Some lenders are even 6% going in debt yields, and they want to be exit on a debt yield. Uh, so it's inherently just like as prices have gone up, lenders are just not going to, based on the going in debt yield, they just can't get the leverage. Like, no, I got this in the mail. <laughs> Interest rates are going up. Now you're able to make more money. 0. 0.70 on my, wait, on my uh, CD. So uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are still good options, but it's going to require lower leverage in these deals. 
lower leverage. Non-recourse bank and recourse bank loans are coming back. So that's like, a, like it's not Bank of America, it's not Wells Fargo, but it's like commercial mortgage banks. Like in Dallas, it would be Simmons Bank or it would be uh, Origin Bank or out here it would be uh, one of the, the large community banks out here. Uh, 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 Bank of California, as I said, B-A-N-C. That's a large community bank out here. They can do loans of a pretty good size, but they'll do it as recourse typically. And then what they'll do is they'll want you to kind of figure out what your game plan is. They'll kind of put some hurdles in, working towards either zero recourse or reduced re recourse. So negotiate that up front. And then they possibly could do fixed rates. So instead of having just adjustable rates, they can do fixed rates with no cap costs. Lower leverage, focus on cash flow. Uh, you may need to, if you're an investor in some of these deals, may to, need to, have, to know that you may get a capital call down the road. And live now, be safe to fight another day, and you'll be able to do that. And then so this is just something that we can talk about. We can talk about the agency lending, so Fannie and Freddie. So this is a chart of what both Fannie and Freddie, the, words are probably, the numbers are probably too small, so I'll just explain them. So back in 2021, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, their caps that they're able to lend on every year were 70 billion, seven zero. And so Fannie did 69.5, so just under 70, and Freddie did just about 70 as well, back in 2021. Through the first four months did this year, Fannie's only done 22.3 and Freddie's at 20.2. And this year they have 80 billion to spend. And so they're not even close. And I know based on the deliveries the next two months, they're also very light. So I bet Fannie won't even be at 30 billion by June. And so they have a ton, ton of capital that they have to, to lend, but they're just, even with the changes that they've made in terms of lowering debt service, maybe pushing on amortizations, they're, they're gonna maybe get to 60 this year. And I had a meeting with our Fannie rep two weeks ago and I, they don't have any pressure to get the number that they have to. And this is every year since they've been in conservatorship since 2008 or uh, 2009, they've hit their cap every year. And so this is the first year they have. So I just thought it's an interesting stat. How bad is it in there if you don't know they're gonna meet their they don't, they don't, they have certain housing goals that they have to hit based on, um, they have to lend them a certain amount of apartments that need a certain AMI, but they don't have, if they don't hit their cap, that's not a negative hit versus uh, their uh, regulator, which is FHFA or the Federal Housing Finance Authority. So if you're not likely to hit their um, target spending this year, does that mean that they'll be more aggressive with the rate? and give better rates towards the end of the year? I think the general feedback is they have come in some on their spreads, um, but they feel that it shouldn't be a race to the bottom. Um, I think they want to hold some of their credit standards. I think they'll come in a little bit on pricing, but not, not enough to get if the 10 years still at 2.8%. They're not going to get much more inside of 150 basis points, maybe 140 basis points over that. So that would put you at what uh, low fours would be best case scenario based on where the 10 years today. Any other questions? Oh, we wanna highlight a couple of deals that we recently <laughs> closed. Um, this was Brooklyn Place. We closed with WGI. Um, one thing I wanna note, this was a floating rate loan. So the ATs do a, float, a floating rate product, um, but it's a 10 year loan. It's not a three year loan. So it's a little different than a bridge loan. But I think one of the things that they did a really smart thing um, this closed back in October or November of last year. Yeah. Um, they bought a 1% interest rate cap, which we'll start paying out like next month, next two months, months <laughs> right? Next month and so at the time it was it, at the time it was just slightly, you know, more expensive to buy the, that instead of I think we were requiring like two and a half or three percent cap, and they just hedged some of the risk at a one percent. I think that was really, really smart. And then I, and the other one was Brookfield. Uh, similar structure and they also did the same you know i think we did a one and a half or one and a quarter cap because it was a little more yeah it's also really start paying from but it's a great property beautiful uh, <laughs> both working with both lincoln and wga
Yes. Oh. Well, Capital Podcast. Capital Podcast. <laughs> so we're going to have our, our annual conference. It's going to be on September the 15th in Texas. We usually have between 750 and 1,000 people join us on that event. We've always had it at great venues. We had it last year at Texas Rangers Ballpark on the field, on the grass. We played a little baseball uh, after the, the conference, which is an all-day conference. The year before, we did it at, uh, that was uh, actually the year before it was uh, virtual, because everybody had COVID. And the year before that, we did it, uh, Coach Lou Holtz came in, and we had it at the, one of the great venues. And before that, we had Roger Staubach at Cowboy Stadium. A lot of people come to, to our events in Dallas. So I know I did a lot of speaking. Fritz did some speaking. Is there any questions about what's going on? Just to uh, tap tap my my break here for a second before we go on to, to hire Matt. <laughs> so just kind of reiterating what you were saying before is that you're kind of seeing that uh, a lot of these people that got into these bridge loans that are coming up in the next two or three years, when the rates are going to come up. They're not going to be able to get that permanent Freddie Mac, Freddie Mac financing. That's good. Right? And then there's going to be a lot of motivated sellers to, yeah. or cash calls yeah. to try to save them. So it's either cash and refinances. And we're already seeing it on, on some bridge loans yeah. today. So we made a loan on a deal back about 18 months ago, $34, $35 million bridge loan, three-year term with two one-year extensions on the deal. Uh, Joe was starting to panic a little bit. Uh, it was the sponsor of the deal. It's at 97% occupancy. And this was supposed to be in the in the oven for three years. He's, he wants to, to figure out, can I get off this bridge loan? Can I go to a fixed rate deal? And what did we learn, Fritz? Cash. You had to put cash into the deal just to refinance the loan. $3.2 million. That was going to be a capital call. Okay. So that's what we're saying is that people are going to start to panic. <clears throat> They're either going to sell a property at a lower price than they thought they were. They're, they're going to be, they're going to feel a little bit less rich. Yeah. They're still rich, but they're going to feel a little bit less rich on, the, on these deals. <laughs> but uh, this is where we think the opportunity is going to come. And working with guys at WGI or with Tony and his crew and with Jack, they're very knowledgeable of what we like and what we don't like. And again, I have probably financed most of the properties in Texas. And that's a lot of, a lot of properties. At least once or five times. What's your take on a multi-family um, in different areas? Can I address uh, these So what's my take on different parts of the, of the country? Yeah, for the market. Uh, I, I'm concerned. Okay. So we lend through kind of the smile of the United States. We don't really do a lot of business in California. We close this year we probably close five transactions in California, but Phoenix, uh, Albuquerque, all the way from El Paso, all the way to Dallas, all the way up, up to Oklahoma City, Tulsa, down to, to Houston. Houston is a hot market these days. I don't know why, because oil prices, <laughs> but uh, it's a hot market. Uh, all the way to the Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and then all the way up to Pennsylvania too. So we see a lot of the, the smile of what's going on. Everybody's concerned because 80 85 percent of loans that we've been doing for the last two years, three years or so, have been these bridge loans, and they are on a skyrocket right now that we're very concerned about. And that, if you go back to yesterday's Wall Street Journal article, you will see it is that cap rates are here, but the costs are up here. And again, if you've been in the business and following. It's as simple as kind of like thinking to yourself, if I was a smart, I could see the subprime business back 12 years ago, how come I'm, I'm not rich? I have to deal. I didn't know how to deal with it, but this, I think we're going to see values fall. This may be an opportunity to buy some of the stuff. Yeah, that's also necessarily like say, the smile of markets. There's still so much debt in migration. So I think like the, the rent growth will be fine and uh, the vacancy will be good. I think the difference is. People were buying deals on like three and a half caps, four uh, percent cap, cap rates. That could be if, if you go from three and a half to five, even if you've executed consistently, you've got a little outlier growth, you're still underwater. So it's just a matter of cap rates have gone so low and the borrowing costs where they are, 
the math just doesn't work um, without also getting it right. Got a question online. Um, what fraction of apartment loans have risky bridge loans that may fall apart? 10%, 50%? Uh, could that spiral into a 2008 style crash of multi-family crisis? So, last 18, 24 months, as I said, 80 85% of all the loans that we did were bridge loans. How many of those loans are going to be affected? I'd say 10 to 15 to maybe 20%. The, the, it's, it, this is just a capital markets deal. The fundamentals of apartment occupancy, rental growth is good. Property taxes in Texas are huge. Everyone's fighting the property taxes, but people are going to get caught in a squeeze because they do not have, they don't have any money in these partnerships. And if they go bring their hat around looking for money, they <laughs> are not going to find it. So I think that's a, that's an issue. I don't think it'll be as bad as the subprime because no. in the subprime you had the debt was really what collapsed and liquidity went away and that's what really took down the whole system. I think the banks are well capitalized. I think these bridge loans are fairly the ones that have issues will be you know a smaller percentage across the whole multi with family space. So I think it'll just be an issue of you know partnerships that lose some money, but not a whole systematic collapse. That's my personal. So I think you mentioned before, you know, even though it's eighty percent bridge loans, but there are some bridge loans that are not as bad as others. Correct. So what would be the differentiation there that you would consider it's a safer bridge loan versus a more risky one rate? that's tied to a fixed rate, one that's tied to an adjustable rate, even with the interest rate caps. Fixed rate is a fixed rate. The onus of the risk is on the depository institution, the lender, which is usually a bank. On an adjustable rate, it is really based on you can be naked in these in the risk. You may not have an interest reserve on it. You may not have an interest rate cap on the deal. That's where the I think the exposure gets, and then having no liquidity. It's good to, to understand where your debt surface is going to be from today for five or seven years, and that's why we like fixed rates. Is because the fixed rates with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I can tell you what debt service is today and what it's going to be five, 10, 12 years from now. I like that. A lot of people don't like fixed rates because the Fannie Mae comes with a yield maintenance penalty. So if you're going to sell prior to the end of the maturity, you may have a significant penalty to say goodbye to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Okay, let's say a few words about uh, Current deals on the market of people maybe regrading or asking for discounts. And so, what, what do you see there? So, I see again, a tale of two cities the good, the bad, and the ugly also, because a lot of brokers, these are people who are selling us these, these deals. Some of them are thoroughly convinced that the market's coming down. And a small subsection are, are saying, this is just a small storm. Don't worry about it. Don't 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 look over there. Look over here. You know. But our position is is that these deals are being retraded. I just had a transaction for 80, 85 million dollars. It was just brought down by uh, to 80, 80, 85 down to eighty three. A deal today was 60, 67 down to sixty three. Uh, deal on Friday from uh, 48 to 44. So, which people, sellers, if they're accepted in the market that things are going sideways or south, they're really wanting to, they want to negotiate to make sure that you want to buy it. Because what they don't want to do is they don't want to take the deal off the market and find out it's really down 10, 10 12%. There's not a lot of buyers to buy it because it used to be. The brokers were the king makers. I'm deciding if you're buying my property or not. Let me give a little inside information. I'm not paying hundred thousand dollars. It's your deal. I'm gonna make you rich. <laughs> they were the, they were the king makers on these deals. Today, it's open to sell it or buy it. A lot of good buyers are pencils down right now. They don't want the volatility. Some lenders are pencils down because they don't like the volatility. So 
that's that's a big thing of, of what we're seeing is right now interest rates go up a lot of buyers and sellers are off the market interest rates are going down a lot of buyers and sellers are off the market anything more to add to that no i, I would agree that's everything i've seen just five ten percent reach rates but most people have been receptive most sellers have been receptive to come down because they understand what's going on we have a, a mutual friend that is under contract or was under contract for $96 million in the property. Now you that's a lot of money. That may not be a lot of money to you, but that's a lot of money to me. And they went to, went to an LOI and letter of intent to buy the property. They go into the due diligence. They, when they underwrote the deal, they underwrote it based on uh, right before February's numbers. They said we can get 75, 72% uh, leverage in the deal with a 190 over sulfur interest rate. Great rate on the deal. Things changed, went from 72 down to 52. In the meantime, they had already executed the contract at a half million dollars on the loan. Went back to the seller and said, hey, listen, we can't accept the rent. He said, we need a $5 million reduction for sales price. What did the seller say? No, the seller didn't say that. So I said, I'll give you $2.7 million. I can't give you five. My buyer says, I can't get any five. Seller says, I'm going to keep the $500,000. And so that's what we're seeing is some, some buyers are willing to walk from these deals. They don't want to make a bad decision on some of these transactions. So $500,000 was just lit on fire. But the buyer did that because they didn't want to buy a property that was sliding down valuation. They weren't going to get the, the right debt to give their, their uh, investors a rate of return on their money. And they felt because they were selling another property over here in exchange and they were going to take say $35 million over here to put it on to this. They would have to raise more money outside this 1031 exchange and they didn't want to do that. So they, they went to another property and they actually got that $500,000 in a better property. So yes, they lost it over here, but they were able to negotiate a better price on another property down, down the road. So we're starting to see that people are just lighters, money, and <laughs> money on fire. Half a million dollars. I know that's a, that's a lot of money to me, but it's not for you. Lisa. I mean, traditionally, you know, an A class building sold, say, Texas, I would say, I would say it's different. A class building sold at a four cap, uh, B class building sold at a five cap, and C was six, right? Now that went down to like three to three and a half on A, three and a half, four on B, four to four to four to four and a half on C. And so I think what you're starting to see at some point that'll go back to kind of where it was. And I think you'll see class A property types not expand as much on the cap rate side and some C, C class will expand a little bit. But for the most part, if this is an issue across all asset classes. But in terms of uh, operations, it seems like A and B are operating better than C. C class building seems to have a little more bad debt. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, primary markets will be hit harder just because in uh, secondary and tertiary markets, you haven't seen as much bridge, bridge lending um, as you have in primary markets. So I think probably secondary and tertiary. You know, we just closed the deal in a, in a secondary market. We have an annual seventy percent, which is rare. It's because the cap rates. It's not a four cap. It's a six. Yeah. So five to ten percent reduction in prices over what six weeks? Two months maybe. Yep. How bad is it gonna get? You know, in the next twelve eight months. Push it. As far as you, <laughs> what does it I mean wouldn't have stand in there. <laughs> I think it's going to go farther down because I think interest rates like that slide was taught about 7%. That that's a, rents do not grow that high that quickly 
like we're going to have another half percent hike and on short term immediately. So that's going to affect the tenure treasury in the, in the, the short term. So rents are not going to be able to run, raise when, go that high. So I think you're going to get hit on that one. I think it's going to come down to the Fed has to actually hike as high as they say they do to kill inflation. We see inflation start coming down before they get to that two or three percent. But I don't see it. I don't think it'll be as bad. But the Fed really does have to hike as high as they say they do to kill inflation. I think that's when you we we're, we're worried about them going actually going from a half percent rate hike to one percent, and what an impact that has on Walmart and Amazon and everything else the people who buy goods. But we're getting killed right now. Sure. Everything is off. There's a question about the last couple of months. What have we been seeing in terms of let's say break it all for non-rich people? Percentage. Yeah, I think it's slower. Eighty. I haven't changed. It hasn't changed. Hasn't no, I mean, we're still doing bridge loans, but we're telling people again, like we've always told people, bridge loans. I hate to use this analogy. It's like a gun. In the hands of the right person, it's fine. In the hands of the maniac, it's not good. So, bridge loans are, are just a tool for you to acquire the property, stabilize the asset, and get the hell out of it. It's not there to, for you to, to take a ride for three to five years. It's not a solution. Get the hell out of it as quickly as you can. And again, bridge loans, there's a, there's a maturity coming on these CLO-based debt fund loans. There's a maturity coming. And the bank loans, typically, if you have a maturity, you can kick the can down and give you more time. The worst thing that a bank to do a depository institution, FDIC, OCC regulated, they don't want to hold the real estate. They want it to get off their books. But if there's a problem, they're willing to work with you because they don't want to argue. I think what we're going through it right now, you're starting to see is maybe a little bit more of a pivot as values come down, the cap rates expand a little bit, uh, and borrowing costs staying fairly flat on the fixed rate side. I think you'll start to see maybe the agencies pick up more business than doing than doing bridge just because valuations will compress a little bit. So instead of being at 45 or 50 percent like they are right now, they get up to like 60 to 70 percent. And at that point, uh, I think you'll see less bridge money. Again, we're advising clients to bring more money to the table. 60 percent, 62 percent max leverage right now. Just to protect yourself if interest rates start to rise, manage your asset effectively. Be part of the solution. Don't just keep buying new, new properties and put yourself on Facebook. <laughs> Those are the people we don't like to do. We do business with them, but we don't like to because we know that they can be dangerous because they're, they're they're not their heads not to try to protect the collateral. I'm a collateral based lender. You guys can go away, but I'm going to be stuck with that collateral. So I want to make sure that you, your head's in the game to protect my collateral. Because these loans are not non-recourse. So you can just walk away, throw the keys back at me and say, it's all yours. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Anything else before we call it a night? And you guys can network and make friends and relationships. <laughs> Brody, keep thinking, baby. I love it. <laughs> so uh, are they still? Because it seems like uh, it's kind of the issue with these bridge loans. Are they taking into consideration the increase in rate hikes for their lending? They are. Yeah. Okay. That's the what he was talking about the dead yield. So when you buy a property, they know because the only thing we have as collateral is the is the right. is the, the property itself. They know that the cash flow is going to go down because you're going to rehab this property. You're going to put units offline. You can put rehab dollars in the deal. But then you're going to start to raise rents on the deal, and then it's going to look like a it's going to look like a hockey stick. Okay, it's going to go up. Okay, we want to see what what you go in at the debt yield there. Which Fritz was saying that's we're, we want to we're bringing this up to make sure that we don't have a big surprise at over here. And so we're 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 raising this up, and then we're raising this, which used to be at like a, a seven debt yield. We're bringing up to eight and a quarter, eight and a half. So we're lowering our leverage in the deal too. A gold, gold star girl, what do you think? Anything more? Yeah, I was going to bring the prices to the 
Yeah, thanks. Can't make any more? No? Whatever she said. <laughs> guys, we, we appreciate getting together. Uh, thanks for being a part of this. Thank you to Tony, Oshi, uh, Albert, uh, uh, Boris, I was looking at Boris, <laughs> and then Tony Lynn and Jack. Thanks for putting it together. We certainly appreciate it. Go meet those guys. We support them. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.